Long ago, the ancient rishis explored the mysteries of creation, birth and death, heaven and earth, suffering and liberation. They sought not only spiritual wisdom, they sought knowledge of the cosmos as well. They strive to understand how the world works long before the dawn of modern scientific methods. Instead of science, they used the power of their own minds. Imagine when the rishis gazed upwards at night and saw stars tracing huge arcs across the sky. What did they think? When they saw the sun's daily journey and the monthly phases of the moon, what did they think? The explanations they proposed were utterly different from the theories of Western philosophers at that time. In ancient Greece, philosophers thought the Earth was enclosed by a giant celestial sphere. All the stars are attached to that sphere, arranged in the familiar patterns we know as constellations. As the sphere rotates, from our earthly perspective, we see stars on the sphere moving across the night sky from east to west. But how did the ancient Greeks explain the motion of the sun, moon, and planets? According to a philosopher named Ptolemy, the sun, moon, and planets are each attached to their own spheres, located between the earth and the sphere of the stars. Each sphere rotates independently, according to the celestial body attached to it. Of course, Ptolemy got it wrong when he put the Earth at the center of the cosmos. Also, he couldn't explain what lies beyond the outermost sphere. An artist depicted this in a wonderful etching of someone piercing the sphere's edge to peer into the mysterious realms lying beyond. The sages of ancient India, on the other hand, envisioned the heavens very differently than their western counterparts. The rishis considered the sun, moon, stars, and planets to be intelligent beings or deities they called devatas. The rishis said each of these celestial deities is ordained to follow a particular path through the sky, the path ordained by Ishvara, the god of the cosmos. The Taitriya Upanishad says, Bhisho Deti Suryaha, the sun rises due to obedience. Ishvara rules the heavens and earth by establishing the laws of nature, which determine how the sun, moon, stars, and planets travel through space. But then, how did the Rishis understand the nature of space itself? They called space Akasha and they considered it one of the five basic elements along with air, fire, water, and earth. But they observed that Akasha has a unique distinguishing feature. It is formless. Unlike the other elements, Akasha has no shape, no form, no dimensions. And since Akasha is dimensionless, it is boundaryless, limitless, and therefore all-pervasive. So, when the rishis looked up into the night sky, they never thought that the moon and stars were attached to giant spheres, but rather that the moon and stars traveled through infinite space, boundaryless, limitless, vast. When the Rishis and the ancient Greeks looked up into the night sky, they saw the same sun and moon, the same stars and planets. Their experiences were identical, but they came to utterly different conclusions about what they experienced. Why? Because they interpreted their experiences differently. We all know how experience can mislead us. We've all been fooled by optical illusions, like seeing this bent spoon, or seeing a boat seem to float in the air when it's actually floating on crystal clear water. A favorite example of mine is watching a beautiful sunset. As the sun slowly dips below the horizon, it's easy to forget that the sun doesn't really travel through the sky. The sun remains stationary. It's the earth that moves. As the earth rotates, the sun seems to set. The sun doesn't go down, 
It's the horizon that moves up. Yet, we still say that the sun goes down. Just like the ancient Greeks said that the moon and stars are attached to giant spheres. Both of these conclusions are wrong. And both are due to the incorrect interpretation of experience. The Rishis examine their experience very carefully, leading to great insights, both worldly and spiritual. Sometimes they contemplated the world around them and the heavens above. But at other times, they closed their eyes and directed their attention within to seek spiritual knowledge, knowledge of reality, the reality because of which the sun, moon, and stars exist, the reality because of which you and I exist, the reality because of which experience itself exists. And to understand the nature of experience itself, the Rishis had to inquire deeply into the nature of the mind because all experience takes place in our minds. That inquiry is recorded in the Kena Upanishad, where the Rishi asks, Kene shitam patati pre shitam manaha. What is it that makes the mind think? How do our minds and senses work? All experience takes place in our minds. For example, when you see a tree, the lenses of your eyes focus an image of the tree onto the back of each eye. There, the retina transforms a tiny upside-down image of the tree into signals which travel along the optic nerve to your brain. Your brain's powerful network of neurons responds by producing an image of the tree in your mind. You see the tree only when its image appears in your mind. In a similar way, signals from nerves inside your ears causes sounds to arise in your mind. And signals from your nose, tongue, and skin cause other sensations to arise in your mind. You know whatever happens in your mind. Every mental event is observed by you, witnessed by you. A mental event is called vritti in Sanskrit. Each vritti is like a ripple in a pond. Depending on what's thrown into a pond, ripples are formed. Small ripples for small objects, large ripples for large objects. In the same way, depending on what you experience, vrittis are formed in your mind corresponding to those experiences. There are three types of vrittis, perceptions, thoughts, and emotions. Perceptions are vrittis produced by your senses when you see, hear, taste, smell, or touch something. And as these vrittis arise in your mind, they are observed by you. Thoughts are vrittis produced by your mind itself. When you think about problems at work or what to buy from the store, your mind creates vrittis corresponding to these thoughts. And as these vrittis arise in your mind, they are observed by you. Your emotions are another kind of vritti produced by your mind. When you feel happy, sad, or frustrated, your mind produces vrittis corresponding to your emotions. And as these vrittis arise in your mind, they too become known to you. Who is the witness of your vrittis? Who is it that knows your perceptions, thoughts, and emotions? The simple answer is that you are the knower. You are the conscious observer of these vrittis. You are the awareful witness. As the Kena Upanishad says, Shrotrasya Shrotram, you are the ear of the ear, the one by whom all perceptions are known. And Manaso Manaha, you are the mind of the mind, the one by whom your thoughts and emotions are known. Here, the word you doesn't refer to your body or your personality. It refers to your fundamental nature as a conscious, awareful being. You, as pure consciousness, are the knower of your vrittis. In this image, the blue water represents your consciousness and the ripples represent your vrittis. Your mind is like a pool of consciousness. Just as ripples arise in water, 
so too vrittis arise in your consciousness. And when vrittis arise, they become known to you, known as your perceptions, thoughts, and emotions. As all these vrittis arise and fade away, their activity is observed or witnessed. Witnessed by whom, we can ask? One of the Rishi's most profound inquiries was to answer the question, what is the true nature of consciousness? The Rishi's discovered that consciousness has something in common with space. Both consciousness and space are formless. Both are dimensionless. Neither has a boundary or limit. Therefore, consciousness, like space, must be limitless. According to the Rishis, the consciousness by which our vrittis are known is all-pervasive. That means your consciousness is all-pervasive. But there's a huge problem here. We don't experience consciousness as being all-pervasive. We only seem to experience consciousness inside our bodies and minds. Consciousness seems to have an edge, a boundary, right at the surface of our skin. Consciousness seems to be stuck inside. Our sense of touch reveals the presence of consciousness from head to toe, but not beyond. So, how can we reconcile our limited experience with the Rishi's discovery that consciousness is boundaryless and all-pervasive like space? To answer this question, we have to return to our earlier discussion about how experience can be misinterpreted. Is it possible that the experience of our own bodies somehow misleads us into thinking that consciousness is stuck inside? In fact, that's exactly what happens. The skin that covers your body is full of nerves by which you feel sensations like cold and heat, texture, pressure, and so on. If those nerves failed to work properly, your entire body would be numb. Did you ever sleep on your arm and wake up with it completely numb? When a part of your body is numb, it feels like a foreign object, a thing. Numbness makes it seem like consciousness is absent, but you don't actually feel the absence of consciousness. You feel the absence of sensation. Let me say that again. You don't feel the absence of consciousness. You feel the absence of sensation. The presence or absence of sensations only tells you about your nerves. It doesn't really tell you anything about consciousness. Here, the blue background represents the limitless consciousness that pervades your body like it pervades everything else in the universe, including the chair. Consciousness is equally present in your body and the chair, but because your nerves are confined to your skin, it seems like consciousness is only in your body. If your nerves somehow expanded into the fabric of the chair, what would that be like? Well, if somebody sat in a chair, you'd feel like they're sitting on you. You feel sensations wherever your nerves are active. Therefore, sensations only tell you about your nerves, not about consciousness. Even though consciousness is boundaryless and all-pervasive, your nerves can't verify this. The all-pervasive nature of consciousness is a reality that must be understood with your mind, not perceived by your senses. You can't perceive consciousness with your senses, but you can certainly understand the nature of consciousness. The consciousness we're talking about is your consciousness, the consciousness by which your perceptions, thoughts, and emotions are known. But how can your consciousness be in the chair? How can your consciousness be all-pervasive? To explore this further, let's try a mental experiment. Imagine that you're sitting here in our lecture hall, and somehow your senses of sight, hearing, and touch gradually stop working. 
Eventually, you are left completely blind, deaf, and numb from head to toe. Now, even though you're blind, deaf, and numb, you'd still be fully conscious. You'd find yourself cut off from the outside world and wonder, what happened? Where am I? Without sight or hearing, you wouldn't feel like you're sitting in this hall, surrounded by people. You'd feel no sense of location, no sense of being inside or outside, no sense of being here or there. And being numb, unable to feel your body, you wouldn't feel like consciousness is stuck inside your body. You wouldn't experience any edge or boundary to your consciousness. And in the absence of any edge or boundary, you'd experience yourself as being vast, boundaryless, limitless. This mental experiment shows how the true nature of your consciousness can be recognized only if you're not misled by your senses. Okay, being blind, deaf, and numb, you'd still be conscious. What would you be conscious of? Well, you'd still be aware of your thoughts and emotions. You'd be aware of your vrittis. In fact, it's these vrittis that make your consciousness unique and individual. These vrittis differentiate your consciousness from all pervasive consciousness. In this image, your consciousness is shown as the water and all pervasive consciousness as the blue background. So, what would happen to the uniqueness of your consciousness if vritti stopped arising in your mind? What would happen if your mind became totally quiet? In meditation, the rishis observed that as vritti ebb away, the distinction between your consciousness and all pervasive consciousness gradually fades. And in the complete absence of vrittis, there's no way to distinguish your consciousness from all pervasive consciousness. This state is called samadhi. In samadhi, your consciousness loses its individuality and becomes one with the boundaryless, all pervasive consciousness. In samadhi, you no longer experience yourself as a finite individual person. You experience vastness. And then later, when the vrittis come back, your experience of being an individual person returns. This leads to our last topic, about the relationship between your consciousness and all pervasive consciousness. In a pond, each ripple is made of water, and that water is the same whether it's in a big ripple, a small one, or in the depths of the pond where there are no ripples. Likewise, each of your vrittis is made of the same consciousness, the same boundaryless, limitless consciousness that pervades the universe. In reality, there's no difference between the consciousness in your vrittis and the consciousness that pervades all. There is only one consciousness. Consciousness is limitless. It's not confined by your body and mind. Right now, you don't experience being limitless because your mind is full of vrittis. But if those vrittis were absent, you would immediately experience the vastness which is the true nature of consciousness. Whether you experience it or not, your consciousness remains limitless. Experience alone can't establish what's true because experience has to be correctly interpreted. And that's why we turn to the teachings of Vedanta. We need the wisdom of the rishis to discern the true nature of consciousness. When you look up into the night sky, you'll never think stars are attached to a sphere. You won't misinterpret this experience because you possess the knowledge that space is limitless. And you know that space remains limitless even in the presence of clouds. In the same way, you can know that your consciousness remains limitless 
even in the presence of vrittis. Clouds seem to constrain the vastness of space, but space is utterly unaffected by clouds. In the same way, vrittis seem to constrain the vastness of consciousness, but your consciousness remains vast, even in the presence of vrittis. To fully appreciate the vastness of space requires knowledge of the heavens. To fully appreciate the vastness of consciousness requires knowledge of your true self, Atma. If you clearly recognize the true nature of Atma, you will never think consciousness is stuck inside your body. When you discover what the Rishis discovered, when you gain true insight with the help of their teachings, you will be blessed with the undeniable realization that your consciousness is as vast as space itself. Thank you.